Magnesium gives particularly tactile satin matte surfaces. I had the great pleasure of being able to sit down with Linda Bloomfield to talk about her work and geek out over glaze chemistry. If you aren't aware of Linda, she's a wonderful potter and the author of some truly essential books on pottery. I referred to her book, Science for Potters, in several previous videos. It's an accessible but thorough explanation of key scientific facts and concepts, a better understanding of which will help elevate your pottery. In this video, Linda will explain how she achieves her beautiful, satisfying matte glazes. Matte glazes can be done horribly so that they are weak or dull or actually dangerous. But with a proper understanding of the science, you can formulate a matte glaze that is strong, matured, and properly velvety smooth. Yes, I love organic forms and the texture, very matte surfaces like marble, egg, eggshells, just kind of lovely matte. Not, I don't like very, very high gloss, so, but I think the matte surface kind of shows the form better. Shows the form better. That's yeah, because you don't have reflections and you can just see, just like, just like a, a shell or, a, or an egg or something, you know, they, they're matte and you can see the shape of it. What, what are the secrets or the keys to, to matte to glazes? Matte. So it, the matte glazes are low in silica. Silica is the thing that makes the glass, or the you know, glass is glossy. So uh, if, it's, if it's matte, it, it will be low in silica and it will have more something, something like calcium or dolomite. Dolomite is a good way to get matte, matte glazes. In my case, I use talc. Um, talc is another, it's, it's a high magnesium, it's a magnesium silicate. So it, talc does have silica in, but it also has a lot of magnesium. And magnesium gives particularly tactile satin matte surfaces. And it, it's uh, soapstone. It's the same mineral as soapstone, which has a lovely kind of soft feel. So yeah, I think most of my glazes have magnesium in, to that, and that makes the soft uh, surface. This is not a true matte, because a, what, what term ceramic materials workshop calls a true matte is an aluminum matte. So it's made matte because it's high in alumina, which is in, in clay. Usually the way you add an alumina to your glaze is just by adding some clay to it. So I have this matte where it's very high in magnesium. So actually it's not a true matte, it's not so high in alumina. It's just so high in magnesium that it's crystallized. And um, it, so it melts fully at the top temperature. But as the, as the glaze cools, as the kiln cools, lots of crystals form all over the surface and those are crystals of mag uh, magnesium silicate but it's a different it's not the same as talc it's um a slightly different mineral form so that the whole surface it looks like a matte surface but it's actually lots of tiny crystals so i think a ceramic materials workshop would call it a crystalline matte are there simple changes you would make to a glaze like this that would would create larger crystals like that would cause them to all, to clump together uh, yeah, if you if you co uh, cool it very slowly, if you put a hold, say around eleven hundred or ten sixty uh, centigrade, then then you you could get a more a more, um, more crystals forming. But it, but this it's so saturated with the magnesium from the talc that you get the crystals even if it, you don't slow cool. Um, I, I think it's like more it's more than half of, of the alkaline metals being being magnesium will often make make crystals. Um, so it's got a, it's got about I think it's more than twenty percent talc in the in the recipe, or you could use dolomite. And it's also got white, some whiting in, in as well. And then these these will also not be prone to like cutlery marking, um, right? Some of the yeah. So they, because they're satin, if you make it slightly satin, so it's got the ratio of um, alumina to silica is is one to five. Uh, if it's one to four, you get a kind of more matte surface. If it's one to five, one aluminum to five silica, you get a more satin. So it's a li little bit higher in silica than a dry matte glaze. And then that will avoid the cutlery marking. So that I've got a black version of it, which would be fine. The white version, you might get faint cutlery marks just because the surface is crystalline. So it's, it's a microscopically rough surface and it just collects the metal from the cutlery. But you can clean that with vinegar because uh, vinegar will, will react with the the metal, then make a soluble metal salt, and then it will just wash off. So you can just, if you just put vinegar on it, it will dissolve. So it's not a scratch, it's a de deposition of metal from cutlery. Because cutlery, it's about a similar hardness to the, gla the glaze. So um, 
it, it's kind of too soft. If, if the cutlery was diff much harder, it wouldn't do that, but they're both the same hardness. So, what, you know, it does pick up some of the metal. Thank you, Linda. More videos with Linda coming soon. For now, I want to take a minute to fill in some of the gaps about things that Linda and I did not cover explicitly in that conversation that will hopefully orient you in this conversation about matte versus glossy glazes. Most pottery is covered in a glaze that is glossy. That is, it's shiny because it reflects a lot of light directly into your eyes. A matte glaze is less shiny because it doesn't reflect as much light directly into your eyes. And that's because on a microscopic level, the glaze has a rougher surface. And so the light that hits it bounces off in different directions and doesn't all go directly into your eyes. So you perceive it as less shiny. There are different ways of achieving this effect. Linda describes the microcrystalline route, which means you are developing a surface with a lot of little crystals on it. This is safe and durable and reliable when you do it correctly. A different way of creating a matte glaze is to under fire a glaze. So if you take a cone 10 glaze recipe, but then you fire it in a cone six kiln, it'll probably come out looking matte, but that's because all of that silica that is meant to melt and form a glass doesn't melt properly. And so it just comes out looking dull. The problem with this route is an under fired matte glaze tends to be very weak. It will scratch easily and it can even leach chemicals out of the glaze into food and drink. In short, it's just not an ideal glaze surface. This cup is an example of an under-fired matte glaze. It's a raw clay that turned out a really nice uh, purple color with a white matte glaze on top. And I actually like the way that this came out. It looks nice, but up close you can see that it's got this pimply texture to it. It's got all these little bubbles and craters. And that's because when the glaze was melting in the kiln, it had too much surface tension or it wasn't melting enough. It was too stiff. And so any glaze will tend to bubble while it's melting. Gases are escaping the clay or the glaze itself. But ordinarily, the glaze needs to be fluid enough that those bubbles can burst and then the craters can fill back in with melted glaze and heal over and cool off into a smooth surface. But if there's too much alumina in a glaze and it doesn't get fired hot enough, then that glaze is really stiff when it's at the hottest temperature in the kiln and those bubbles form but don't have enough time to actually burst and then melt back over. So this is just one example of something that can go wrong with an under-fired matte glaze, you get this pinholing. Linda described the method that is the surest way to get a reliable matte glaze that's gonna really work on a food surface. Many glazes, if you cool them very slowly, will actually develop some crystals in them. A lot of my cups and bowls have a glaze that will develop lots of golden crystals on a dark background, but only when it's cooled slowly. If it's cooled quickly, then it just turns into a single dark colored glaze that is very glossy. I love this effect because it adds depth and color and texture to an otherwise very boring glaze. So I hope you're enjoying these videos that include other artists and teachers. This year I'm expanding the scope of my little video channel here to include other guests and profiles of artists whose work I really admire and respect. I'll still be doing videos of just me and my experiments and the things that I learn, but I also want to use this space to showcase other people who I think are doing really cool things in the world. So I hope you'll check back next week for another video. Thanks.